It's a great pleasure to be with you again tonight. We're thankful that we can be together to spend some time looking at some biblical subjects and to think about some of the passages of Scripture associated therewith. You know, one of the things that I enjoyed so very much uh, after I first became a Christian was to learn about the history of the churches of Christ. And I'm turn and thinking about primarily the congregations of the Lord's Church in the United States of America. And uh, one of the things that I did in order to accomplish that was when I was at school, I took the classes that they offered at, at Henderson, at Freed, took those classes in Restoration History, and then I discovered along the way a gentleman named Earl West, Earl Irvin West, and you may have in your library here in the church, at, maybe at home, you have in your library uh, his series of books entitled uh, Search for Anci the Ancient Order, The Search for the Ancient Order. And there's a number of volumes in that series that pertain to uh, what people did in order to get back to the biblical pattern. And of course, that process is called the Restoration Movement. That's what it's called in historical uh, circles. And this, this is a, the principle of restoration is that we're not interested in a further development of theological principles. We want to go back to the Bible for those principles and to put those principles in place in, in our lives. A restoration was made necessary because of apostasy. Historically, what happened in the, uh, certainly, even within the first century, but definitely in the, in the centuries that followed after the establishment of the church in the first century, what happened was the church moved away from principles that were revealed in God's book. You think of those departures from the faith that developed in the, in the latter part of the first century all the way up to the present. And from time to time, we, we talk about those, and, and it's necessary to do so. It's not the most pleasant thing that we're ever called upon to do, but we should have been prepared for the fact that, that would happen as, as a body of people, because Paul said in uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4, in verse 2, he said, preach the word, be instead in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort, with all long suffering and doctrine. He said, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts or desires shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they should turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. Uh, it was prophesied that that would happen, and indeed that's what happened. Uh, earlier, Paul had said over in, uh, in 1 Timothy chapter 4, beginning with verse 1, Now the Spirit speaks expressly that in the latter time some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of the devil, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, and then he goes on to cite some examples. Now, this is, this is just what happened. And, and what happened after that was that, that uh, people decided, well, why don't we just go back to what we find in the Bible and follow that pattern that is in God's book. Now, of course, uh, you know, those of you who've, who, who've uh, looked into matters pertinent to church history, it's, it's a long <laughs> and a winding road as to what occurred. But one of the things that I think it's helpful to think about in connection with that is just to look at what the Bible says about this question of going back to the pattern that's revealed. The reason, the reason we gather the way we do on the Lord's Day, now we gather other days too, but we, we know we simply must gather together on the Lord's Day, we follow a biblical pattern. And that's, that's, uh, that's what it's all about. When I try to explain New Testament Christianity to people, I talk about the pattern. And I say, well, now there's a pattern in the Bible, in the New Testament, that we, we can and we should follow. And Paul, in, in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 13, he tells Timothy, the young preacher, 2 Timothy 1, 13, Hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me in faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. Now some of the later 
translations, the New King James, I think, has pattern there. Hold fast the pattern of sound words. And there's a pattern of sound words that's revealed in God's book that we can follow, and we can, must, and should follow that pattern. Now, this concept of restoration is therefore a biblical concept. If restoration, if that, as, a, as an idea or as a set of ideas, now I like, I like to talk about idea sets. Uh, I got into this concept from, because when I was in the seventh grade, uh, my math teacher uh, introduced us to the new math. <laughs> and and uh, she told us all about having, taking our numbers and putting them in sets, number sets. And the parentheses went around that. Now, I don't know what's being done now, and I probably don't have enough mind to understand what's being done now. But nonetheless, that was very impressive. And so from that time forward, when I, whenever I think about a complex idea subject, I like to put the ideas into sets, just like you put numbers into sets. And the idea set that to me is so helpful for us to understand is this concept of restoring New Testament Christianity. And there are a number of ideas that fit together in those sets. Now that, as a principle, that wouldn't really be worth anything if it wasn't biblical, but it is biblical. As we looked at that passage there in 2 Timothy 1 and verse 13. But other places we find in God's book that this is also revealed. In 2 Kings 22 and 23, we have the restoration that was led by King Josiah. And uh, it says in 2 Chronicles 34, 2 of him that he did not turn aside from the right hand to the left. You know, one thing. <laughs> One thing that we all know in our world today, we get in trouble when we work on the extremes, when we operate in the extremes. And what Josiah did, he, he wasn't an extremist. We might say, well, he was extreme in that he wanted to restore the operation of the law of Moses the way it should have been. Yes, but the text indicates the key to his perspective was that in, in attempting to accomplish that goal, he didn't turn to the right hand or to the left. And what was read for us before, uh, what Mark read in, in Ezra chapter 7 and verse 10, for Ezra had prepared his heart to, to seek the law of the Lord and to do it, and to teach statutes and ordinances in Israel. And see, we're still about that, not... not, not in terms of the law of Moses, because that's what Ezra was teaching. But we're interested in doing God's will. And that's what those passages in Timothy, 1 Timothy 4 and 2 Timothy 4 indicate. Now, one of the great passages and in Luke 8, 11, you know, in the, the parable of the sower, where it says the seed is the word of God, that's a great restoration principle. If we will simply plant, if people will simply plant or allow to be planted in their hearts the seed, which is the word of God, then what's going to result in the planting of that seed? Well, it'll be Christians. It'll be New Testament Christians. And to get anything else, you have to plant something else. One of the things that on the mission field that I, I really love about doing that kind of work, it's, it's been a while since I've been able to go anywhere outside the country because of COVID and other things, but one of the things I love about that is when you get with somebody who doesn't have any preconceived notions about what the Bible teaches, and you show, you show them principles like these, like the pattern, 2 Timothy 1.13, or the seed is the word of God, or that people like Ezra just wanted to seek and to do God's will, when you show show them passages, you can just see the light go on in their minds because it's simple. It's not complicated. <laughs> I still remember that when I first came in contact with you people, that's what I call what Ginger introduced me to, you people. When I first came in, I, I was thinking, you know, people told me where I worked, the fellows I worked for were very fervent in their religious perspective. 
and they warned me about you. Oh, they said, don't, you got to listen. You got to be careful with those Church of Christ folks. That's what they call it. Because those Campbellites, what they'll do, they'll brainwash you. And I said, really? Y'all know Ginger. Does she seem very much like a brainwasher to you? I don't think she is. And I didn't really run into any brainwashers. But what I ran into were people who presented. They said, well, you know, we're just going to go by the Bible. I said, okay, I don't have any problem with that. And as time went along, I began to see things like the seeds, the word of God. And there's a pattern in scripture that we need to follow. I remember I was, uh, <laughs> we were riding home one evening from church. We started out, at least I started out going to church. Where she went to church was the Druid Hills Congregation in Atlanta on Ponce de Leon down there. I may have mentioned that. And uh, the preacher there, Roger McKenzie, who, by the way, used to hold meetings out here at Cool Springs. Not Cool Springs, or maybe it is Cool Springs, out here on the road uh, back your way. And, and uh, Roger would be preaching along, and he was, ta- he was teaching one night on uh, the reason why we don't use instrumental music. And he went to this idea of we're just following a pattern. We're following what the New Testament church did, what they did in the first century. And I remember on the way home, I said, you know, Ginger, I'm beginning to understand a lot of this. But I just don't understand that. Because everywhere I'd ever been with anybody before, you know, one of the big parts of the work of the church was the bands and the orchestras and all of the organ playing and the piano playing and all that sort of thing. I said, I'm just not sure I understand that. And she said, uh, I'll never forget what she did. She kind of patted me on the leg. She said, uh, she said, you will. You'll see it. You'll understand it. And sure enough, I did. Now, somebody says, well, she just brainwashed you. I just don't think I'm brainwashable. I'm a little bit too stubborn for that kind of behavior. But what she did was, was she revealed to me, helped me see what the Bible was teaching. Now, one of the fellows that I got interested in early on, I've mentioned him already, Brother Earl West, who wrote uh, those, that series of books. Uh, one of the things uh, he talked about was, uh, and this was in a lecture that I heard him give somewhere, he said that what happens in uh, the principles of restoration, there are five words that you can use to think about the concepts and ideas of the restoration movement. First of all, people have to be willing to search. They have to look. They have to want something that they don't have. In other words, if and this is the way the restoration movement worked. You know, you, you talk about the Campbells and the Stones and all of that. What they were doing, they were looking at what was available in the religious world in the United States. And what they saw was a lot of confusion and upset and agitation. And people were just fighting mad over these things. And so they began to search for another way. And that's one of the fascinating things about reading this history is to see how they worked their way to where they needed to be. So they would search, and then Brother West said, there's discovery. They began to see something in the text that uh, they hadn't seen before. Then the next step is acceptance. And after acceptance, there's practice. And then after the practice gets established within congregations of people, there's communication of this idea. So uh, I I think that's one of the fascinating things about what we're involved in. Now, I know the religious climate in, in, uh, in our world is not what it used to be. And I know the idea of going out, say going door for door, door to door, you know, uh, you know, that used to be a pretty effective methodology. You go uh, one house to the next and say, would you like to set up a Bible study? We could come back and study the Bible with you. Well, we call them back in those days in the 50s and the early 60s, we call them cottage meetings. I suspect a number of you went on those kind of meetings. They're very effective. Well, our society may not be as effective. That might not be as effective a methodology in our present society. But um, 
we can still, whatever opportunity is placed before us to teach, we need to teach some of these principles that we have in mind. First of all, when we think about the restoration movement, one of the key things associated with the restoration movement is union. The concept of union. Christian union. Now, people like us are often accused of being divisive, of being di dividing folks. But in actuality, what, what we preach, if we preach God's word, we're going to preach the concept of Christian union. And there's a plea associated with that. The plea we find in places like uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 10, where Paul said, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all do what? Speak the same thing, that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Now, people are quick to say, well, we'll never do that. You know, we'll never all agree on everything. Well, that's not what he's talking about. What he's talking about is that they need to be of the same mind and the same judgment concerning the subjects that the Corinthian correspondence is about. You know, whenever we try to take a statement like that and make it apply in some sort of wide-ranging uh, application that it's not meant for, it's going to make no sense. But if we make it apply in the context of 1 Corinthians, that they need to be of the same, they need to be together on the subjects that are dealt with with that congregation in that letter. And that has to do with a whole lot of very important biblical doctrines. But the principle applies all the way across. So there was a prayer in the New Testament associated with that plea. And where is that prayer? Well, that prayer is in John chapter 17. And you know who's praying that prayer? In John chapter 17. Well, it's Jesus himself. Now, verse 20. When he, he's talked about these things, uh, he said, uh, he's praying to the Father. Let, just pick up with verse 13, for example. He said, now come I to thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them the word, and the world hath hated them, because they are not... Of they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not that they should, uh, that thou should, uh, shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from evil. Uh, they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. He says, sanctify the, th excuse me, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so I have also sent them into the world. He's talking about he's praying for his disciples. And then he says, and for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified or set apart through thy truth. And then verse 20, and this is where it comes home to us. He says, neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. So we have a plea in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 10. We have a prayer in John 17 and verse 20. Well, somebody says, okay, God wants us to be together. Uh, how is it that we're to be together? Well, there's a, there's a plan. And the plan is revealed in the book of Ephesians. In Ephesians chapter 4, um, verses 1 and following. He, Paul says, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you call, with all lowliness and meekness, all long, with uh, longsuffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit the unity of the Spirit will be the unity that the Spirit desires for us to have and the unity that we will have if we will follow the Spirit in the bond of peace. And then he says these, these ones, he says there is one body, one Spirit, even as you're called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all, through all, 
and in you all. Now, if you'll notice, those ones there encompass all of Christian doctrine. Each section stands for a larger group of doctrines. So that's the plan that we follow. And then, if that doesn't get it, there's that pattern that we refer to in 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 13. Hold fast the pattern of sound words, which thou hast heard of me in faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. So when we think about the restoration movement, it's God's way for the church. And these principles are easy to discern. Turn over to John chapter 12, if you'd like. John chapter 12 and verse 48. Jesus is the one speaking here. And what we have here is uh, one of the bedrock passages pertaining to the principle of revealed truth. This is a great restoration principle. Where do we get our truth? Now, you know, in our world today, people say, well, God speaks to me directly. God speaks to me directly, and, and I believe I'm following God's will because I'm doing what I hear God say to me. And if you have two people who take that position, you may well have two different positions on any, on any subject. If you have three people, you could end up with three. And if you have four, you know, it just goes on because if God is speaking directly to individuals, then each person has his own private interpretation of what God wants done. But Peter said there is no private interpretation. That there is but one. Well, in John chapter 12 and verse 48, here's what Jesus said. He that rejects me and receives not my word has one that judges him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. So, it's unwise, I believe, and, and I love everybody, and I understand why people think they need to follow their hearts because the religious world, and particularly the Christian religious world, in many ways is just drilling that idea that you just you know, follow your heart, do what your heart says, and that's, that's God speaking to you. But it, that, that doesn't seem to be any biblical example of that. The biblical example is to follow the truth, and the truth is revealed by God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. As the passage here says, Jesus is the one speaking. He says, if you reject me and don't receive my words, you have one that judges you. The word that I have spoken shall judge you in the last day. I don't want to try to follow anything but what is inspired by God. You know, First Peter said in 1 Peter 4, 11, if any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. In other words, if you're going to make some sort of pronouncement about, about what uh, we ought to do in, in our religious lives, it needs to be something that is backed up by Scripture. Now, as soon as you take that position and you run with it, sooner or later, somebody is going to suggest to you that you, are, you have adopted a simple-minded perspective and that you are not really delving into the subject adequately. In other words, to say that we've got to go by what the Bible says. And that's what John 12, 48 and 1 Peter 4, 11 says. People, the popular view in uh, the theological circles is to go that way is simple-minded. It's a lack of sophistication. Well, yes, it is. And Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 18 to the end of the chapter says that's the way he thought about things. He, he, th he said we ought to go that way. We simply need to speak as God would have us speak. That will result in us being 
restorationists. In other words, we're going to go back to what the Bible says. But folks say, well, listen, what about something new? You know, we, we're all, one of the things that we fight all the time in the Lord's church is the idea that when something new comes along, we're against the people's the kids say, well, now you're against everything that's new. And um, I really am, I think. Isn't that terrible to say? I believe I am. You know, down in uh, Bartica, in the country of Guyana, over in the Essequibo province, there's a fellow, Michael Osborne, black fella, preacher down there, been preaching at the Bartica Church for years and years and years. And he fights it every day because the church down the street has a band. The church down the street uh, has all sorts of uh, material things that are, you know, that they have contributed to them that they just give out. He said, we're sitting here. Of course, we, we support the congregation. The congregation supported well. It supports itself. And he keeps telling people, he said, you know, the solution to all this division and confusion is an open Bible and an open heart. And if you have those two things together, you'll find your way to a life that pleases God. And that's what we need to do even today. But somebody comes along and says, well, I've got something new. I've got something new. When somebody starts telling you that they have a new way to interpret Scripture or they have a new understanding of Scripture, the first thing to do is to run as hard and as fast as you can. Because a man said, a pretty wise man, a fellow named Solomon, said a long time ago in the book of Ecclesiastes in chapter 1, he said, there is nothing new under the sun people say oh well look you know you got quantum physics that's new he wasn't talking about physics he wasn't talking about chemistry but i'll tell you something real chemistry real physics and real biology has not changed now we we're discovering a little bit more about it as time goes along but it's the same it's always been you really think that uh uh, you know, uh, chemical equations have changed over the years. No, they haven't changed. Our understanding of them has changed, but they're all the same. Whatever it is, the power that God put in place that keeps the planets from crashing into each other or falling out of the universe, that hasn't changed. It's just like it has always been. It's nothing new. It's always the same. And so the idea of restoration, I think, is a valid principle. I know it's a valid principle because these biblical principles go right along with it and are associated consistently with those things that we've talked about. Speak where the Bible speaks and remain silent where the Bible's silent. That was an old saying among the restorationists in this country. You know, do Bible things in Bible ways. What could be wrong with that sort of perspective and idea? I think a lot of congreg a lot of denominational groups, perhaps today, as they see themselves falling apart based on this one and that one and everybody demanding their perspective be accepted, might find that to be very helpful. And then there's this uh, old expression that... Uh, one of the Campbells, Thomas, the daddy, uh, presented and put forward, but it was an older one uh, presented by another fellow named Maldinius, and then before that even Augustine. Not a few others are credited with this expression. In essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. And in everything, charity or love. And I think when we look at that as, as a way forward for the church, and I think, I know many of you know this and you've studied this and you've read after this material, but I think it's important for us to remember that this concept of restoring New Testament Christianity, 
and keeping it restored. We have to keep on working on it because, as you know, the playing field has changed and uh, people have different perspectives and we have to keep on restoring it. But when I talk to people, when I suggest to them, when they say, well, now, Bill, what in the world are you about? What are y'all about? What is, what's the idea that's associated with what you are doing? I say, well, we just simply want to go by the Bible. And yes, it does require one other thing. It requires the desire to think critically. You know, in Acts 17, 11, the Bereans were more noble than those at Thessalonica. We have to be associated with critical thinking. It, it takes some struggle within one's own mind to see the essence of the restoration movement. Paul said in Ephesians 3, 9, we have to make all men see. The first man that has to see it is, is us. You know, we have, to, we have to resist the concept of compromise. Because if we ever start to really compromise our biblical principles, we'll decline. We might be in a state of decline in terms of the overall brotherhood. I'm not as pessimistic as some are. There's a major publication among the Lord's church that suggests that congregations are closing faster than ever. I'm not sure that's so for the reasons that they suggest. But even if we do enter into a period of decline, we need to be ready to begin again based on the principles that we have revealed. This is why it is absolutely essential. Even though sometimes we may become discouraged that congregations like East Hill and Hobbs Street and other faithful congregations of God's people, that we hold on, that we keep on holding on, that we don't give up, and that we don't give in, and we keep, to use the expression that y'all use around here, keep teaching the truth in love and never stop doing it. Because if we stop doing it, we're bound to disappoint God who sent his son to die to establish his church. Matthew 16, 18, and John 3, 16. I pray that lesson has been a benefit to you tonight. And if tonight you're here and you've, you've thought about these things and perhaps you say, well, you know, I, I want to be part of something like that. And, and tonight I'm ready to obey the gospel and be part of the Lord's church. You know, you can find a lot of people tell you many ways to be saved. But what about Jesus? what Jesus said in Mark 16, 16? He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be condemned. But Acts 2.38, where Peter preached, repent and be baptized every one of you for the remission of your sins. And so many other passages. That's just, going, that's just going by the pattern. That's just going by the pattern. And if uh, you find yourself in need of the prayers of the saints, the saints are here. Our elders will be glad to pray with you and for you. If there's anything that, that any of us can do to be of assistance to you in your spiritual journey, would you come as together we stand and sing?